So compromised VO2, work rate, demands the same oxygen, no problem. But VO2 max goes down, so your ability to take up, transport, metabolize the oxygen is compromised. Probably due to the fact that it's harder to take up oxygen. Saturation is lower because the PO2 in the environment is lower. There's less of a push into the body. There's less oxygen, a lower gradient to the muscle to be able to deliver that oxygen to do work, to make energy. So we have this compromised ability to transport and use oxygen. Like VO2, cardiac output is fixed by workload. So the workload that you're doing requires a certain liter per minute blood flow. It's similar at sea level as at altitude here. This is 67 or 6,100 meters. Um, similar to the, the silver hut levels that we're looking at. And notice these are overlaid one on top of the other. As work rate goes up, oxygen uptake and work rate are analogous. They're one and the same. Cardiac output goes up in lockstep, whether you're at 6,100 meters or at sea level. Your maximum cardiac output, though, is lower. A decrease from 24-ish liters per minute at sea level to maybe 20 at altitude. So maximum cardiac output is lower. And it's probably, probably not due to changes in function of the heart. It might be, depending on the amount of time that you spend at altitude and if there's any morphological changes in the heart. But it's probably due to exercise being overridden and shut down by other signals, other alarm bells, probably related to the lower uh, O2 saturation in the blood and some other metabolic factors being produced that stop you exercising before cardiac output can go up. Now it looks like there might be a bit of an issue at altitude because we see heart rates higher for any given workload when you're at altitude, which implies that stroke volume must be lower. Right? Cardiac output is heart rate times stroke volume, so if heart rate is higher, it suggests that it's compromising, or sorry, it's compensating for a compromised stroke volume. So maybe there are some blood volume issues going on in the background that we can measure or monitor. But either way, cardiac output is fixed by the workload, but similarly, cardiac output max is reduced. In terms of measuring the blood, it's difficult to say what happens. The trend is that uh, red blood cell content goes up, hemoglobin goes up, plasma volume even tends to go down. The trend is there's the general increase in blood volume, um, but some of these changes are quite variable. And so we might be concerned with the operative unit of carrying capacity, hemoglobin. Usually a good surrogate is a hematocrit or red cell volume. When that increases, hemoglobin also increases. Um, and we see some 30 to 50 percent increases, but they're still lower than uh, the Andean natives, the Sherpas that live at altitude. What this suggests is we are adapting to exposure, but we're not fully adapting. Uh, adapted. Let's look at some of those changes. <clears throat> so, same individuals, L. Griffith Pugh, Jim Millage, uh, Mike Gill, Mike Ward, John West, the same guys that we saw on the picture 
um, authoring the paper. These are their data, their values, either at sea level beforehand or during acclimatization at, I think this is in the month leading up to their expedition up the mountain. So this is time spent above sea level in weeks. This is them acclimatizing while they're getting ready to make the trek up to base camp and looking at plasma volume, red volume, blood volume changes. So blood volume, we're going to look at standardized to body weight. You can look at the, the mils per kilogram change. This is how much volume is increased. But a way to, to relatively compare between individuals is to express it as a percent. So pretty large percentage increases for some, 30% increase in blood volume for some individuals, 10% increase for others, despite spending three, two, three weeks at altitude acclimatizing. Only 10% down here for Griffith Pew, 30% for Mike Ward. Um, now the question is, did he already have a higher blood volume to start? The answer is slightly, but Mike Ward still ends up having more blood volume after acclimatization is done. So wildly variable changes in blood volume. Overall it goes up, and it goes up because red cell volume goes up. And red cell volume is if you take all the red blood cells, mash them together, what volume do the red blood cells occupy? Red blood cells are the, the oxygen carrying units that contain hemoglobin. Um, what? This is the um, this is what you're trying to increase with blood doping. This is what you're trying to produce more of with EPO administration. How does red cell volume change during the same acclimatization period? And they go up as well. Some individuals have a 100% increase, a doubling of red cell volume compared to their uh, values at sea level. Doubling of red cell volume, which is fantastic, if that implies carrying capacity goes up. Blood volume goes up, red cell volume goes up, but plasma volume tends to go down. Despite a decrease in plasma volume. Now there's a few ways to, to um, consider this. It seems, it could just be a change in hydrostatic pressure. So the pressure outside of the body is a lot lower, and so maybe fluid leaves the vasculature as a result of that pressure difference, maybe. It also seems like this is temporary. <coughs> In a lot of cases, the initial drop is bigger as you start to acclimatize, and then plasma volume recovers. So where it drops by 20% at first exposure in this third or fourth individual, it's only 5% lower than baseline by the time you're acclimatized. So maybe this, this drop in plasma volume will fix itself eventually, and these measurements didn't give enough time to see that return to normal. That's entirely possible. You also have to wonder what it matters, because plasma volume doesn't carry much oxygen. It allows space for red blood cells to travel, and the red blood cells carry oxygen. And what does it matter if plasma volume goes down? It's difficult to interpret that uh, decrease in plasma volume, but it, it seems as though it normalizes and we might not have to interpret it if given enough time. Red cell volume goes up, blood volume goes up, plasma volume drops initially and then recovers, but really hemoglobin is what we're looking at. Hemoglobin is what binds oxygen more of it means more oxygen can be bound. And across the board, we see robust improvements in hemoglobin uh, concentration. 30 to 50% increases in all of these individuals. 
to 20 grams per deciliter um, 20, 18, 17. Some of these individuals respond really well because they had low hemoglobin concentrations to start. 12, 13, which are very low to start. 14 or 15 are typically normal. But overall, a rapid induction of hemoglobin. But still lower than Andean natives. 30 to 50 percent increase. But these are still lower than the natives that live in this region. And we have a section later on to, that asks, okay, what makes a really good mountain climber? Ideally, you would want someone that's fully adapted. Well, wouldn't you then compare to native individuals of that region? They would be fully adapted. Wouldn't they make the best mountain climbers? So maybe what we're looking at here is um, we're looking at robust changes, which is interesting, which is good. After three weeks, we see 50% increases in hemoglobin, but maybe it's not enough. Maybe we need something else in order to engineer the best case scenario for these mountain climbers to make it to the summit. Um, okay, where are we looking at? So changes in um, blood volume can't really explain the changes in cardiac output. Blood volume goes up. Plasma volume drops initially but recovers. Red cell volume goes up. But for some reason, cardiac output is lower. Maximal cardiac output is lower. It looked like stroke volume was compromised as well. Not because we don't have enough blood volume. We're doing everything we can to increase uh, blood volume, plasma volume, red cell volume. Something else must be at play. When, uh, when looking for an answer to questions like that, to make more invasive measurements, uh, we might turn to a completely simulated expedition to Mount Everest in a clean room with more advanced measurement technology with the ability to take biopsies to look inside the muscle we could send individuals off on a 40-day expedition in an environmental chamber where we modify the altitude specifically to match what we would call their ascent right we, this would be their expedition we would tailor the altitude in the environmental chamber to uh, create an artificial expedition for these individuals that we want to study. And this is the profile of such a simulation. This is called Operation Everest 2. I think there have been two or three more since then. But this diagram shows really nicely how the, uh, the pressure is modified to simulate an expedition. And here it's measured in TOR, which is essentially one millimeter of mercury. So this is 429 millimeters of mercury, 347 millimeters of mercury. One tor is one millimeter of mercury. And you see a progressive increase from sea level at 760 to base camp area around here, and then eventually the ascent to the silver hut type levels where we do individual ascents and then return back uh, to that level to sleep overnight. Just periodic ascents during the day and then return back to normal levels overnight, varying between 280 and 240 millimeters of mercury. So those numbers I'm pointing out because when we look at a table in two slides, they'll come back. So just note where they are on the, on the slide. So in this environment, does it work? Is this uh, an accurate representation of altitude, or is it skewed? Is there something missing that we can't reproduce in a chamber? And again, a really good way to um, evaluate whether this works is to see how VO2 changes. Gold standard, uh, all-encompassing measure of ventilation, carrying capacity, metabolism, and work rate. How does VO2 change in the chamber? And does that compare 
to VO2 changes that we observe on the mountain. And there is general agreement. So the Operation Everest 2 data are these large open circles. You can see them paralleling this bottom curve. And the bottom curve is data from the Silver Hut experiment. We just looked at the tables with work rates at 50 watts, 100 watts, and you saw the progression um, through different altitudes. That's the data plotted differently here. So maximal oxygen uptake is how high they were able to go at different altitudes. So a repackaging of the data that we just looked at. And there's comparable data for the AMRI expedition that we introduced a few slides back. Overall, even though there's a slight difference in the starting fitnesses, and there's only a difference at sea level, the AMRI fellows were, ladies or fellows, I'm not sure, were more fit than Pew and uh, the Operation Everest II colleagues. But there's a convergence where at altitude, the altitude limits VO2 similarly. In the Silver Hut experiments, in the AMRI experiment, from the Silver Hut series of studies, the altitude and the lower PO2 limit VO2 max to a similar degree. All of these lines converge and they overlap. And so we're just happy to see that our simulated values line up with these trends. They're realistic. They're not way off to the side indicating something's wrong with our application of the simulated altitude. They overlap. Now the mechanisms that explain this we don't know yet. We're not sure. We think it's the lower PO2 because saturation is lower. But now, in this environment, we can go into the muscle. We can look at signaling factors. We can take different biopsies, tissue samples, collect urines, whatever we want because it's in a controlled environment. And this gives us permission to do so because we see the same representative traces here as in the real world experiments. Oh yeah, sorry, I, I forgot to mention, not that I forgot to mention, but I forgot to put up the uh, equivalent altitudes. So these are VO2 maxes at the, uh, the daytime venturing altitudes. These are VO2 maxes at 8,000 meters, which we saw in the AMRI study, and we could simulate in, um, in the Operation Everest 2 data, but we didn't get that high in the Silver Hut experiments. We stopped at 7,400 meters. And then the rest is a projection. If you were to go higher still, what it would look like. So what I really want to do is look at the muscle. And let's quickly do that because we have five, six minutes. I'll, I'll introduce the idea and then we'll delve into the data a bit more when we come back on Thursday. I want to look at the muscle and see, can changes in the muscle explain or add to, <coughs> excuse me, add to our understanding of why VO2 max is capped? or add to our understanding of why cardiac output is capped? <clears throat> is it only that saturation is reduced? Is it only taking up and carrying oxygen? Or is there something metabolic going on as well? We can make a bunch of different kinds of measurements. <clears throat> Dr. Kane might take out some individual mitochondria and separate them and uh, open up the fibers and measure their respiratory sensitivity or respiratory efficiency, which is usually typified by this ADP to O ratios. And essentially what this says is for a given amount of ADP, or sorry, for a given amount of oxygen, how much ADP is required to turn up metabolism. If you have less oxygen, this number, this ratio becomes greater. Overall, the efficiency should increase. You should get better at making uh, ATP with the limited uh, oxygen available. 
When we use the Operation Everest 2 data in a controlled environment, we can look at the histology, we can look at enzymes, we can look at efficiency. And over 40 days, the muscle is not static. Over 40 days of simulated expedition, so you're still exercising, you're hiking up a mountain, you're doing simulated work in this chamber. Key oxidative enzymes go down, which is not how you want them to change. Key oxidative enzymes are things that make ATP. They're, they're uh, tools in the mitochondrial toolbox. You want them to go up. They go up typically with exercise training. You'd think they might go up with this stress at altitude. They go down. When we measure capillarization, it tends to go up. That is, the number of capillaries per fiber is higher. And that makes sense if you're adapting to altitude. You might think, oh, that's good because we're increasing the capillary network. We're distributing blood further into the muscle. We're making it come in contact with more muscle fibers because delivering oxygen is hard at this low PO2. But on closer inspection, it's not that we're spreading out the capillary network. That's not changing in the muscle over these 40 days. The muscle fibers are atrophying. The fibers themselves are shrinking. So yes, there is a greater capillary to fiber ratio but the fibers are shrinking. It's not that the capillary network is expanding. The fibers are shrinking. Again, not something that you want to have happen. You want the enzymes to be abundant. You want the muscle fibers to be large. Larger muscle fibers mean more force, mean more uh, endurance, less fatigability, more strength. And they shrink. It didn't affect the overall ability to produce force on a single bout, but it did accelerate fatigability. Which means if you were to hoist yourself up onto a ledge once and require only one pull-up's worth of contraction, you're fine. If you have to do it multiple times in a row, you fatigue faster at altitude. So that's, that's pretty bad. As far as muscle function is concerned, fewer oxidative enzymes, smaller muscle fibers, it looks like we might be able to um, maintain strength, but those fibers fatigue faster. This describes a pretty poor situation of events at altitude for successful mountain climbing. These are the changes. The data is coming up on the next slide. We'll come back and explore the data that backs up these points on Thursday. And then we'll get into things like appetite, food, sleep, different other logistical constraints with altitude before finishing up. Hopefully Thursday, but probably we'll spill over into next Tuesday a little bit. And that's fine. Because it's all altitude for this and next week. Any questions about...